You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 296 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. And I'm joined as always by my co-host, He's my cousin, and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? It's a peaceful night in Wrigleyville. Thank you. Excellent. Glad to have you here and glad to have our special guest with us. Uh, You know him from his monthly appearances here on this podcast, all of his baseball writings, and uh, you know, just a longtime friend of the show. Always a great time when we have Jared Willis on to talk Cubs. Jared, thanks for taking time out to talk with us tonight. It is my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Well, it's uh, it's another week. <laughs> uh, Cubs baseball happened, um, and ooh, let's let's quickly take a look at the week that was, uh, and then we'll get into the news, and then uh, and then we'll see where it goes from here. But uh, looking at last week, since last we podcasted. Uh, the Cubs surprisingly swept the Mets in New York. Um, that was definitely something I didn't see coming. And then, of course, they come home to lose two out of three to Colorado. The uh, The Friday game, Marcus Stroman looked fantastic. Cubs able to win two to one. And then uh, they lost the next two to Colorado. Jared, you were at the Saturday game. What was the... Uh, what was the big story coming out of that uh, out of that game? Yeah, you know, Saturday was uh, it was the Hayden Wesneski start, um, his first start as a major leaguer. You know, obviously he's done a lot of starting in the minors and in college, but this was the first time he's he started a game, and he actually looked quite good. Um, he had, I think, in the first inning, gave up a double to the second batter of the game but then went on to he he retired 16 straight from there so really settled in and was doing well you know um the problem was the the cubs offense rewarded him by scoring one run and then so i think in around the sixth or seventh inning when he gave up a run and then the bullpen bullpen came in and gave up a couple so the cubs lost three to one but it was like the just one of the ugliest three to one games I think I've ever seen. Um, you know, the, the quality of baseball was not great, but, uh, but yeah, so really Wesneski was the story of the day just because looks, looks as advertised and, you know, not that you want to put too much into one start and certainly not one start against the Rockies, but I liked what I saw and, um, so it's encouraging just for their future pitching wise, just to see that they're, they appear that they're going to have some options for how they can fill out that staff next year. Um, that was the, I think if you take anything from Saturday, that, that was all that was worth paying any attention to. Yeah, Pat, we had Wesneski and, uh, Elzele made an appearance as well. Yeah, that's, I he, saw that. Yeah. The Elzele appearance was, was quite the uh, spectacle. It had been quite a while for that one i was i i did, did jared did you know that he was on track to come back or did he just kind of pop up i i, I wasn't yeah he, of... we he had he was officially activated that day so i knew that he had thrown a bullpen the day before and so when i got to the park on saturday i knew it was a, a pretty strong possibility that he'd be activated but as far as like him getting into the game wasn't necessarily sure that that would happen right out of the gate but i think it worked out well because um i want to say wesneski went seven innings and so then alzale came in to pitch the last two if i'm remembering right or there might no maybe it was six innings and he pitched the seventh and eighth no, no and then, you're right wesneski uh, am i pitched, right yeah okay. he pitched seven innings uh three hits and one then, run and then uh, alzale came in for two uh, and he gave up two in the, he in the ninth. Two. Yep, that's right. Because he, um, Azale, it was he came out and he was looked brilliant in the eighth inning because he he struck out all three of the batters he faced. Um, 
And then in the ninth, he came out and he gave up two runs, but then he also struck out two of the guys. So I think he had five strikeouts in two innings. So, um, you know, it, it's I'm sure a lot of adrenaline and nerves for him because it's been essentially a year since he's a, last appeared on the mound. I, I had to look it up. It was October 1st of last season was the last appearance that he made. So you know, he's had a long time, a long time to rehab and work on getting himself back out there. So I'm sure there's a little bit of nerves at play, um, but definitely some good things about what Alzelay did um, that night, despite the two runs. And now as it's, you know, as, as I'm remembering it, some of that came from, there was some defensive tomfoolery out there, if I remember right. But uh, so yeah, pitching wise two two performances that you can take a lot of positives from. And then of course the Cubs, uh, uh, like I mentioned, lost uh, on Sunday four to three uh, to Colorado. So Colorado now uh, 64 wins to the Cubs 62 as we continue to keep our eyes on the race to the bottom where the uh, <laughs> to see who's gonna get the uh, the the opportunities in the lottery uh, this season. So we're, we're keeping a lookout on it, but man, uh, it, the Cubs Cubs still have a lot of work to do. Uh, Cincinnati and, and Pittsburgh are both below them in just the division. So uh, Pittsburgh with 55 wins, Cincinnati 58, and of course Washington with 51. There's a lot of bad teams. Uh, Detroit 56 wins and Oakland 53. So there's a lot of bad teams out there, uh, and the Cubs – Sitting middle of the pack in the National League Central, which is pretty uh, pretty wild to see them with 62 wins. Yeah, it really underscores sort of the conundrum here. What the what are the Cubs doing this year? Really, um, they sure started off as if they were tanking, and have done a pretty good job of that throughout most of the year. But like you said, Jeremy, if you're going to tank, tank. If you're not. You know try to win and they seem to be sort of doing neither um i mean at this point they may not even finish the bottom 10. so uh you know right now they're you know to, to the extent that they in the past when they tanked remember when they got chris bryant with the second overall pick and even before him Almora and Baez and, and the picks after like with schwarber and hap you're talking about pretty high picks in the, in the draft, you know, fifth, sixth, seventh picks. Um, this year, I guess they're right there going. They'll probably draft like 11th or 12th. I don't know. Um, so is this a, I mean, it's a lost year in terms of performance on the field. It's a lost year in terms of um, the development of some of the guys that they had hoped to, to have great seasons, but especially the younger guys um, at the, you know, in terms of the major league level. Uh, so tell me what what the positives are besides that one game that Jared eloquently described. I think that's a positive. I think uh, yeah, Marcus Stroman's uh, performance was also a positive. You want to see him uh, be that kind of pitcher going into uh, into next season. Jared, was there any uh, uh, was was all the talk in the ballpark about uh, uh, the rookie uh, making his debut, or were people still buzzing a little bit about uh, Stroman's outing? Yeah, there was definitely some carryover buzz um, from Stroman, who had pitched the day before. Um, and I think it's kind of speaking to, to, yeah, to the larger question that you've raised is definitely, if you look at what they've done kind of since the All-Star break, they've really played like a team that has a different objective. Um, you know, and I... I know they're probably right around 500 since the all-star break, but there's definitely been moments where they they get to, they're a few games above 500. So they're looking kind of like, is this a team that's, they think they're ready to start turning the corner next year. I, I know that hasn't felt like the plan for a while, but here lately, I think some of the language from uh, Ricketts when he spoke last weekend and some of those kinds of things it, you know, it's hard to – you can't really take any of it at face value, especially when it comes from him. But it, it does feel – it does at least have me wondering, 
have their do do they think that they're closer to competing than than maybe the timeline that we had expected before a few months ago um i don't know and it, i don't want to read too much into a couple of months worth of baseball in a throwaway season but there's there's lots of th- encouraging signs there's we just talked about Stroman, but also if you look at what say suzuki has done since he got back from the injured list he's really been solid um i was just telling somebody at the ballpark the other day i think ian happ is finally maybe not as good as we'd hoped but really looking a lot more like the player that you thought you were getting when he was drafted in the first round however many years ago um we have this fleet of young pitchers that there's the keegan thompson justin Steele. now maybe west nesky um if stroman can really pitch closer to what we saw then are you in the market for top tier arms that you can you know then these guys are supplementary types of pitchers instead of taking on primary roles there's a lot of things like that where it kind of feels like it is 2023 feels a lot less sure to me than it did two months ago and yet not to be the contrarian but you know, the best pitcher on the cubs except for the one game where he gave up the seven hundred runs is probably drew smiley right <laughs> I mean, he's right, right up there with Justin Steele, and yet here he is, a free agent. You know, so replacing his his productivity in the rotation would probably, if you just said, well, how much would it cost to go get somebody to do what he's done this year? You know, probably about $17 million, I'm guessing, right? I mean, it it's so, so it's like two steps forward, one step back. Well, yeah, I mean, and I think I would say I would point to – not as dramatically so, but Adrian Sampson a little yep. bit too. That's the other one, right? And yet, are either one? Of, I mean, Smiley will be free agent. Is is Sampson somebody they anticipate being in the rotation next year? He's, I mean, I don't know. He's a late bloomer, maybe. I mean, he's thirty years old, and he's pitched well for the Cubs for the last two years now. In in you know the opportunities he's had, but. I don't think that's he's part of the. I don't think he's part of the next championship team, right? So. No, I, yeah, and so and then those are the things that make you wonder: um, is is the success that they've had? You know, and I'm saying success in quotes, but you know, since middle of July, is some of that just some good good old fashioned smoke and mirrors where you have yeah. Samson's and Smiley's pitching really well and just having a stretch where they're doing great, but this isn't a sustainable level of performance and not something that you can build a future around. And right. Um, it feels you know. illusory. It feels like what right. you said, you know, that, that somehow if they wanted to have the same pitching productivity next year that they've had the last, you know, seven, eight weeks, eight, nine weeks now, it would cost a lot of money because, because they've been getting this sort of, uh, overly exceptional performance from guys who either aren't going to be here or are very unlikely to repeat this year's success. And perhaps the good news on that front is, at least in terms of where they are compared to the luxury tax threshold, they certainly have they have the budget. If they want to spend some money in the offseason, it's there. But Oh, yes. Yeah. No, we, you know, we've heard that uh, it's up to Jed to spend the money. The money's right. there. He just yeah. needs to spend yeah. it. That's what we heard. Yeah. Tom, Tom's <laughs> giving him all the money he wants. He's just got to spend it. That's all. It's just, you know. All right, Jed. Well, Jed, balls in your court, buddy. Go and yeah. take that checkbook and get to work. Yeah, it's You'll it, need a catcher, too, um, and you'll need a first baseman, and you'll need, you know, a couple other things, but by all means, probably shortstop. Speaking of shortstops, what's up with Nico Horner? Is he – how hurt is he? It sounds like we actually that that came up when I was there Saturday. It sounds like it's worse than what they initially thought, because when he got hurt last Sunday against the Giants and left the game early, um, the initial response was kind of, "Oh, it's just you know some tricep soreness. Um, he's day to day, and you know." But then close to a week goes by, and then I'm there on Saturday, and it's like, "Yeah, things are looking worse." than we thought. And then when Ross spoke about it, he said that his words were that Horner was disappointed in the medical results. 
um, that he feels okay, but it sounds like like he feels okay, but what he's being told as far as the condition of his arm is not what he wants to hear. Um, is he going to yeah. surgery? And if so, is that going to knock him out for a year? Because that talking about the development of the team for next year, that could be a that's, major. That's huge. I mean, he's the best player on the team. Uh, yeah, war wise, right? And, and, and right, and, and in terms of the position he plays on defense, I and his age and all those factors like he's your guy and he's the guy you need to yeah that that would be devastating i you know to be blunt that would mean the Cubs have to go out and get a pre agent shortstop as they've talked about doing but that person would not be paired with nico horner they'd be paired with nick madrigal probably or somebody like that i hope not. who yeah who has yet to demonstrate that he can stay on the field i mean you know, he's you get these little flashes of Madrigal and what he can bring on offense, but so far his major league career has been defined by the guys hurt all the time. He's um, only played fifty nine games this year. Feels like he played a little bit more than that, doesn't it? But no, no, yeah, and and not that many games for the White Sox last year before he has a season ending injury. So, and, and, and his like, OPS plus is sixty eight, which is really pathetic. Well, I mean, that's, that's yeah. when he VR. does play, he doesn't Jonathan do much. Yeah. yeah. And I, I think some of that could be attributed to just the not consistency in how much he's playing because he is hurt, but it, you're still, it's like, well, I want to see you on the field and I want to see you stay healthy because if you really are the hitter that you have been advertised, you know, as, as being, we need to see that. And, but the problem is you don't stay on the field long enough to, to ever really get a chance to show that on a, a sustained basis. So um, I'm, yeah, I'm not real, real sold on him as, as being any part of the Cubs future, which again, kind of going back to Horner, which is why I hope that that arm's okay. Because if they do sign a free agent shortstop, like Trey Turner or Correa or somebody, you can bump Horner over to second base and your middle infield looks real solid, real fast. And I hope that, uh, you know, some of the, some of the arms that have been encouraging in the last few appearances are guys that they package in potential trades even to, to get better sooner. Uh, and, and you can, you can include some of these guys because, uh, you know, you got to sell high on some of them. We don't want to, you know, ha- have a few good, good enough, uh, uh, appearances. You know, a lot of these guys in the minors, you know, they lost the COVID year and they had, you know, there's just, there's not a ton of tape on some of these guys. So if the only things you have are great major league outings, like ride that and get out of that position as soon as you can, if you can package that for a trade that gets you better sooner. I, I just have this fear that if Horner is out, say for a year, um, that it would be a, not an excuse, but it would be a rationale for maybe not going as all in next year on free agency as, that certainly we would hope with the thought that, well, there's just, there's too much ground to make up. So, you know, why, well, you know, it's just, we can't do it. So we're going to be play it again. Like we did in 2022 with some retreads and hopefully get the next David Robertson, and, which looked a lot like 2021, <laughs> maybe get, maybe get a, a Suzuki type, you know, as a splurge, but, but don't go overboard. Don't get a Trey Turner. Don't get like a, you know, a top, you know, top of the line pitcher. And, uh, and then maybe like for first base, instead of Schwindel, maybe next year we'll have Matt Mervis and he'll be the first baseman, right? And, and everything will be fine. And, and I, I just don't know if this is, um, you know, if I, I don't think that that strategy, if they tried to redo last year's strategy, especially losing Contreras and losing their entire bullpen, like they will probably do a couple of their starters. I, I just feel like they'll be spinning their wheels a little bit, kind of biding time hoping that the guys in the minors get better. Maybe a Brennan Davis shows up next year and actually, you know, is hitting and maybe a Caleb killing can throw strikes and things like that. Um, I don't know, Jerry, what's your, what's your take on uh, if, if there is a hoarderless 2023, how will that impact the off season? Yeah. I, first of all, I think for what it's worth, the way that they talked on Saturday, it does not sound like this is this is an injury that's going to put him out long term. They 
certainly does not sound that way. Um, they still kind of talked like they thought there's a possibility he could return this season. Um, or at least David Ross's words Saturday were, he doesn't have anything left to prove to us this year. So with the season two and a half weeks left, they might just say, hey, it's not worth you trying to come back and then play for five games. So maybe we shut it down. Right. Um, and then even uh, one of the other reporters kind of floated the, you know, asked the question, floated the idea of like, well, do you, you know, do you just use him as a DH? Do you, you know, just so you can get his bat in the lineup? Um, and Ross, you know, Ross didn't immediately shut that down, but just kind of said, yeah, but there's still the chance that if he's sliding or if he's doing something like that, that he can re-aggravate the injury or make it worse. Um, so, you know, just again, the way that they spoke doesn't sound like they think he's going to be out for a long time. Now, I do find it kind of odd that they were, they're not being super specific about what's going on. They just keep talking about his triceps. So, I don't know. But let's if, if we imagine for a moment that he is out for 2023, needs surgery, he cannot play, then absolutely I think we are you, you're in for another season that's going to feel very much like what the last two have been. Um, cause they're, I, I, not that I want them to do it, but I, I completely understand why their justification would be, well, without Horner doesn't really allow us to do what we had planned on doing. We had this vision for how this off season was going to go and the team that we thought we could field in 2023, but now we can't. So let's, let's do another round of, yeah, find the next David Robertson and a bunch of bullpen arms like they have for the last two years, which is for the mostly worked out pretty well for them. They do a really good job of finding these guys and showcasing them in the first half and then trading them and, and getting some pretty good returns. And so, but I didn't, do I want to watch another season like that? Definitely not. It's, you know, I'm, my patience with this kind of thing is, is pretty thin. So I'm trying to cling to the hope or the optimism that Horner's issue isn't something that's going to be lasting and that he will be ready to play like next year, even if he does get shut down for the rest of this season. Yeah. Cause it, it, all the reasons you just, you just described uh, <laughs> going into a 2023 that, that is much like 22 and 21 it's uh, you know, there's extra not motivation for them to do anything crazy because uh 25 to 30,000 still come through the turnstiles every single, every single weekend game. And uh, even in September there, here. So there were, there was an announced crowd of 34,000 on Saturday. Yeah. Um, uh, and it, granted it was 83 and sunny. So yes, the weather's beautiful, but like I was sitting next to Gordon Whitmire and we were talking about how, it was like a prime college football Saturday. The, the slate of games that day was you know, about as good as you can ask for. What better day to be at your house or at a buddy's house and barbecuing and watching college football and doing all that. And yet there's 34,000 people there to watch the Cubs and the Rockies. It's yeah. I mean, and yeah. 35, six the next day and 31, seven the day before and, 40,000 against the Giants the previous Saturday. Meanwhile, the Cubs uh, headed to Miami Monday night, and the crowd was 8,315. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's They definitely have some built-in advantages. It'd be great if they could spend the money they make through that attendance and the concessions uh, on the team, but, you know. That's uh, exactly what we were promised. That and all the ballpark renovation. That would all go back into the team that's currently a hundred and some million under the luxury tax. So we'll we'll see how next year goes, how the offseason goes. We're a couple of weeks away from the end of this season, and then we will head to the winter meetings. There will be uh, all kinds of uh, uh, moves, and we'll know, I think, pretty quickly where – where this team is uh, going into 2023. So uh, fingers crossed on the Nico Horner injury. We did have some other news uh, that top of the news here, Frank Schwindel was released. You mentioned it earlier in the podcast, Pat. 
Uh, Frank Schwindel released, uh, if we remember back to just last year, Schwindel was Rookie of the Month in August and September of 2021. And here he is. The fairy tale is over. Seems like a good guy, made for an interesting anything in 2021, but uh, end of the... uh, uh, end of the line for for Frank Schwindel. Yeah, his OPS, his OPS plus fell below that of Jan Gomes, so it was time to go. Um, Frank Schwindel is is a guy who got super red hot for a couple months at the end of last year, and the Cubs um, went ahead and 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 made him their first baseman this year. I think you know it was a cost saving measure, just like I was talking about. They might do with Mervis. The difference being, I guess, Mervis is twenty four, Schwindel is thirty. And uh, they thought they were hoping to get away with the season of, of him at first base, but um, the clock turned midnight pretty quickly in the season, and he turned into a pumpkin. And uh, despite his his heroics last year at the end of the year, he just wasn't uh, wasn't major league ready as a certainly as a um, first baseman this season. So yeah, they had to let him go. It's not part of the future. Yeah, I think we saw that there's a reason why he had bounced around from organization to organization the way he had with these brief stints in the major leagues. Um, It became pretty apparent. And I think I told this story before, but uh, last year, and, you know, around this time last year, when he was announced as the, might have been right at the end of the season, but he was announced as the, the NL Rookie of the Month for I forget, August and September. September. Yeah, both. Yeah. And a, a different Cubs player approached uh, me and a, another writer and, and just said, uh, I've got a, you know, a baseball trivia question for you guys. When's the last time two 30-year-olds were named Rookies of the Month in, you know, in the same season? And you know, we kind of had a good chuckle, but it was also like, at least the other players on the team kind of know it. Like, yeah, how, how much should we really expect when a guy who's 30 is having this breakout performance? Uh, usually it doesn't mean that he's actually a good player and it's just taken this long for, for that to show. Usually it means he's, you know, maybe getting a little bit lucky, maybe, you know, a lot of different things. But So it's not a big surprise that it just didn't work out with Schwindel. I'm, the only thing that surprises me is that he kind of hung around as long as he did. Uh, some of that is just a testament to, if not him, who else was going to play first base. Right. So, Freddie Freeman, but I guess, you know. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if only there had been options in free agency. Yeah. But, right. yeah. No, but this is the Adrian Sampson scenario, right? Like, you're like, okay, yeah. well, he's 30 years old. He seems to be... He's, he's started 15 games. He's he's looking pretty good, right? And then you know those things have a chance. Those things have a tendency of evening out in baseball for whatever reason. And it's way way more often and more likely that the guy who who shows this in a short stint this late in his career, it, it does not work out. I cannot think of more than a handful of examples of guys who just took that long into their career to really break out it's just that is by far the exception of the rule so more often than not yeah when you see a guy who's 30 or so you know having this breakout performance it's like eh, you kind of got to look at that with a side eye and uh be very wary of it three years ago today do you guys remember anthony rizzo being announced in the lineup 30 minutes before game time against the st louis cardinals coming back after four days when people thought he might be done for the season due to his sprained ankle. He comes out to the Undertaker's theme song as a big wrestling fan and then podcast host that I am. Uh, Big uh, excitement as he walks out to the Undertaker's theme song and homers in his first at bat. Do you recall this game three years ago? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's of the many things that Rizzo did in a Cubs uniform, I think that's one of the things that spoke the most to how deeply he cared about that team and how much he cared about winning and being competitive. Um, I'm trying really hard not to to sound like corny and cheesy and like a cheerleader, but 
Uh, I was a big fan of Rizzo as a player and because of things like that. And I think all the way back to, what was it 2012 when he was ready to fight our oldest Chapman when Chapman was still <laughs> on the Reds and they had that big brawl. And, you know, he was the guy who was leading his, his, the team even back then in that kind of a moment. And so it kind of all comes back around seven, eight years later when he's coming back, when at that point in the season, physically the, you know, the thing to do is probably just say, all right, I'm going to shut it down. Uh, but no, he, he was back out there. So he's, forever will have my respect for a lot of things like that. The Cubs, by the way, did lose that game. It was the third of nine consecutive losses <laughs> at the end of the year that cost them a playoff spot. But, you know, hmm. I like the lore, though. And, and great. It was a great moment. And and it's one of those yeah. uh, you love, you know, you're seeing what Rizzo is doing nowadays. And, uh, and, and you have these moments uh, on an anniversary like that today. So that was fun to see those clips floating around Cubs Twitter. Uh, Kyle yeah. Hendricks was a starter that day, by the way. Remember him? <laughs> uh, also on Cubs Twitter, a uh, post from Ken Rosendahl talking about uh, talking about in an article that several teams believe it might make more sense to go in a direction where they go with a four-man rotation as a potential response to the way the game is evolving. As pitchers throw harder and harder, clubs are exploring new ways to manage their workloads. The numbers already suggest that most starters are not capable of succeeding a third time through the order. But what if starters threw 70 to 75 pitches every fourth day instead of trying to exceed those totals every fifth day? A team could use its best pitchers more often and those pitchers still could reach 200 innings, albeit in a different way, by making 40 starts of five innings as opposed to 30 starts of seven. I thought that was an interesting take uh, and, and interesting to hear that the teams are, are considering doing that. Um, the Cubs have never been a team that really plays with trying to do unique and innovative things that doesn't seem to be their brand uh but it seems like something i would i would like to see what do you guys think about uh the possibility of, of the cubs tinkering with a four-man rotation maybe uh piggybacking some of these guys uh that, that that we talked about earlier it'd be good for keegan thompson i think right yeah he's one of the first guys that comes to mind who he's in either a, role really right he right. can start or it could be the reliever yeah, and or kind of like what we saw when we talked about Saturday's game, you know, Alzale has starting experience. And so even as in a situation where Wesneski doesn't even doesn't go seven innings, but then you can go to somebody like Alzale and pick up three or four. Yeah, I'm intrigued by that idea. And I'd love to see some teams try it and wouldn't mind if the Cubs were one of them. Um I'm never like necessarily opposed to teams trying stuff like that you know let's experiment with this as an idea because you know why not and if it if it's if it's the way that the game is evolving better that you are one of the teams who is at the front end of doing the new thing and having it work for you rather than waiting for two-thirds of the league to do it and prove it to be successful and then you jump on board because then it's just too late and it does, you know, I don't know that it really helps you. So yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. I'd love to see him try it. It's the kind of thing that you would have expected the brewers to do in the old days. Now they've got good starting pitchers. So maybe not now, but you know, it's that kind of a, kind of a mid market kind of thing that where they get these competitive advantages over the big market teams by saying, go ahead, spend $25 million on your starter. We'll get a guy for one eighth the price and we will, put him out there for five innings and ha ha, you know, we'll spend another 5 million on a reliever and we'll be just as good. So yeah, maybe. The, the only thing I do wonder is I'd be curious to talk to some starting pitchers about it because they are so their, their routine between starts for most of them is pretty like, you know, they're, they're pretty careful about it. And so if you take a day away from them, 
say you're pitching every, you know, yes, your inning total at the end of the season is probably going to be the same. The number of pitches thrown um, won't necessarily be that much different, but the key factor might be, well, now you have one less day in between starts to do what you need to do to prepare. I'm sure they could adjust eventually, but, you know, these are people, baseball players are notorious for, I have my routine and this is how I do this. And if you throw something like that at them, that forces them to change. Um, I could see that being a potential roadblock. No, you're, you're spot on. I, any team that's got uh, a, you know, veteran starting pitchers, uh, that'll be probably a hard yeah. no, uh, but teams like the Cubs that are just, that have a bunch of young guys that are all trying to get a spot. Uh, right. This is a way you can, uh, you, you can play with some of that and see if the numbers are working out as as you anticipate and then if so then that's where you invest uh if you can or you go out you you go out and get a 34 year old john lester type who can only pitch five innings anyway but but only gives up one run in those five innings that that could work yeah i'm just imagining i'm wondering about guys you know imagining myself going to like max scherzer and saying hey this is what we need you to do now and having him you know I yeah I don't even, I don't even know how he would respond to that. Who knows? Maybe he'd be open to it. But um, my suspicion would be some of those types of pitchers are are going to say no. That's not how I do this. I'm I'm not on board. Yeah, it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, you know, as rule changes come in, as as the game and and the the types of pitchers continue to evolve, uh, which teams will be the ones out in front trying the innovative new things uh you know especially within within new rules uh you know within the constraints comes creativity so we'll see uh uh which of those teams are creative it's never never been the cubs brand so i don't expect <laughs> i d- definitely don't expect the cubs to be one of those uh, uh teams on the, the the front side of that but uh definitely uh definitely will be fun to see the the teams that do experiment and let's take a look ahead here um i think that's all i had for news so we can look ahead to the next week uh the cubs lost in miami at the as the time of this recording one big inning gets away from them they get stomped by the marlins 10 to 3 two more in miami before a four game road trip in pittsburgh and then they come home for the final home stand of the season the last week of september Philadelphia and Cincinnati before they finish up in October. Uh, they play all the way till October 5th in Cincinnati. Just, it's like a punishment, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, looking at these, uh, at these last games, Jared, what are, uh, uh, what's something that you're looking at, uh, you're looking forward to or hoping to see uh, the Cubs uh, do or, or, a person partake in uh, as we get come down the home stretch of games. I am looking forward to them getting to Ox- October 6th as yeah. fast as we can. <laughs> um, no, I, I think just a continuation of some of the stuff that kind of like we talked about earlier, some of the younger players, seeing them be able to finish the season strong, be able to finish healthy. I know it looks like I saw the news today. I think Keegan Thompson is expected to be activated soon and will probably pitch out of the bullpen. You know, we're kind of waiting to see if Justin Steele is going to make his way back. Those are the things I'm keeping an eye on. And of course, like Nico Horner, we talked about earlier, if, if his injury is really as mild, maybe as we're hoping, um, then does he come back? That's, I mean, that's really it at this point is just what, what can we see from some of these guys as they finish out the season when Suzuki comes back from the paternity leave, you know, he's got a few days for the birth of his child. Can he continue to hit the way that he has? But yeah, I mean, that, that's really it. But yeah, otherwise it's just, let's get this season behind us. Cause I'm very, I want, I just want to see what's next because if it's another 2021, 2022 type season um, next year, it's going to be a long year ahead of us Whew. pat what about you well, I, I want to know just want to get this done yeah, I, wanna, I mean I, i've been done for a little while if you noticed but uh, <laughs> I, i'm curious 
ask him, Jared, like, is there anything salvageable out of this combination of like the the Revises and the Reyeses and the Velasquezes and I don't know the Kinstries and Bodies like Homosia? I mean, is there anything out of this that you can say, yeah, this this guy is you know could either increase the stock in the next two weeks significantly or has already done so that makes you feel like okay, well, this guy's a piece of the future. Even Morel at this point, like. Who among this crew of of, of younger ish players uh, has has shown you enough to say, yeah, I, I think we pencil that person in for next year, and maybe not as a starter, but on the on the major of the roster. Of that group, I think the only one who I, I would Morel is probably the only one has who has shown enough, just because of the fact that he's. He's been up in the majors and stayed there since the middle of May. And he's definitely had his ups and downs, but that's to be, I think, to be expected. And so I would like to see how he handles and is he, you know, an off season works on making some adjustments and comes back and performs next year. He's, he is, he has faded <laughs> Big, uh, yeah. every month since he started. Uh, you know, his, his OPS this month is 464. Last month was five seventy five, seven twenty four, eight eight fifteen. Right. I mean, he's 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 getting worse. Um, and he's and I he's, don't know. He's down at the bottom of the batting order now. You know, he's yeah. yeah. So, and and under different circumstances, he's probably doesn't stick in the majors all season long. But um, I do think because of some of the flashes of what he showed, especially early. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I just think I just like to see. How he can adjust? Sure. What does he? What does he look like next year? Um, but yeah, other than that, it's kind of like, have I seen anything from Nelson Velasquez that makes me interested? No. Same for Rivas. The same for, um, you know, McKinstry. I just feel like that hasn't been enough. Like he's, what, he, what he's else had can like, this guy do? He's having a heck of a week. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he's he's had a great week, but you know, like every. Any other he got his OPS like, plus up to 73, so it must <laughs> right, have been a big like, week. Let's, uh, you know, let me just see what over a longer stretch of time. But, but yeah, so there's just not like that whole group. These are very much filler types of players where when, fingers crossed, the next great Cubs team comes along, we're going to be, I hope, look, you know, I, I don't know. I, I suspect we're going to be looking back and saying, oh, yeah, remember when Nelson Velasquez was playing s- some games in, in the outfield for the Cubs that year? Whatever happened to him? And let me look, you know, yeah. now I'm Googling and finding out. You know, it's going to be guys like that who we're going to kind of forget ever played in the organization. Um, and I hate to say that kind of thing because these are guys who are doing their best. But I, I think just realistically, that's where we're at with those types. Well, and yeah, I think some of these guys aren't going to survive the 40 man roster cuts, right? So some of these guys will probably no. never see again after this year. Um, yeah. And that's actually, I had that conversation with Whitmire on Saturday. Just we're kind of going through that lineup that day. And when they were all out on the field and just pointing to spots and saying, how many of these guys do we think are actually on the roster April next year when they break camp and, and start the season? And it, it was not not many. Remember 2013? That, that remember, uh, uh, Jeremy? I know you remember this guy. Remember Dottie Murphy? Of course. Dottie Murphy was a platoon third baseman, had like a dozen homers or so, and put up a, a very uh, impressive uh, offensive production, OPS, OPS plus, and um, never saw him again because he was 30. You know, and <laughs> and it was he was a filler guy, and he was mm-hmm. a platoon guy, and and. They brought another guy up pretty shortly thereafter named uh, Chris Bryant. And, uh, you know, that's the way it goes. Um, but, Mike Golton, you know, then Chris Bryant. Chris Bryant had to work on his defense huh. for a few weeks. So we did have yeah, We yeah, needed yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. How could we forget like, Mike Holt? The guys you're talking about are almost like the poor man's version of Donnie Murphy. At least he, he was, <laughs> you know, successful. The guys you're talking about have, have struggled. I mean, it's, I don't know how fair it is to, you know, you give a guy a chance in the majors and they get sporadic. At bats, but you know, I mean, Revis has had over 250 plate appearances, and 
you know, so these guys have, have it's not like they haven't had a chance. Morales had 380 some. Yeah. Velasquez is coming up on 200. You know, they, they've played, they just aren't playing well. And then, of course, you've got David Bodie, who you owe, he's the one guy you owe money to. So, and actually, offensively, in theory, I mean, technically, he's had the best season of all of them. So, who knew? But um, I don't know, you know, he might be somebody who they wait on a little bit um, just because they do owe money. Not much, but some. But yeah, I think you're right. I think a lot of these guys will will sort of be victims of um, of roster cuts. As let's put it this way, if if those guys are still all on the team, or many of them are on the team next year, that's probably a bad sign. That means the Cubs did not significantly upgrade the roster. Well, we've got a lot to uh, a lot to to watch for here as the the off season is coming up just a couple of weeks away, and we will see how the Cubs march towards 2023 and what they're going to do and what we're in for as a podcast for 2023. But one thing I do hope is that uh, we'll have Jared back many, many more times uh, next season. So uh, Jared, in the meantime, please remind all of our listeners where they can find your work on the internet. You can find me on uh, CHGO. So that's all chgo.com. That's where, the vast majority of my writing shows up. So uh, look for me there. I'm on Twitter at J Willis, J W Y L L Y S. And then of course, uh, I think I would love it most of all, if you subscribe to my newsletter, it's the dugout on Substack. I have a link to that in my Twitter profile. So you can come check that out. Absolutely. It's a must subscribe. Um, and you can follow us on Twitter at Wrigleyville Nat. Same for Instagram. There we have uh, pinned to the top of our Twitter. Uh, we have our T Public shop. We've got merch, and there's a sale going on. So it's an end of season sale. Go get get yourself some Wrigleyville Nation merch. That helps us. Uh, if we put every single penny right back into the podcast, and uh, because. We have patrons over at patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation. Those are the folks that keep this show ad-free. We are a couple weeks away from finishing up our fourth season. No ads, uh, all because of our patrons over there continuing to support the show. Again, every penny goes right back into the show. So thank you, all the patrons who keep all the freeloaders here listening to the show. We really appreciate it. And uh, another way you can support the show is not only subscribing to this podcast, Cubs fans know other Cubs fans, so make sure you're telling them about the podcast, showing them how to subscribe to the podcast as well. The other way you can support us is we're trying to get a YouTube channel up and running uh, for, for next season. So we've started to put up the audio versions of the podcast on the YouTube as well. So give that a subscribe over there. Um, check uh, our, our Twitter, and, and you can also get to that uh, from our, our website that has all the links to subscribe and interact with the show and the entire back catalog of this podcast. All of that is at the website, WrigleyvilleNation.com. And with that, we're calling it a podcast. We're wrapping it up. Pat, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.